Real progress is being made in a laboratory in Canada. Here, the full significance of the physical laws of light and space have become clear to John Hutchison, and he is utilizing this knowledge to produce cause and effect experiments which lead to an understanding of the harmony of nature. Science, in harmony with the laws of nature for the good of mankind, will hold great values in many fields and would advance its course beyond our present comprehension. John Hutchison has been working in the areas of electromagnetic forces and the changes in the molecular structure of materials for many years. He has in this time achieved a breakthrough in anti-gravity knowledge, providing spectacular examples of heavy objects flying through the air without any visible signs of propulsion. He has also made amazing discoveries concerning the alteration of compositions of materials by subjecting them to a form of electromagnetic bombardment. We're looking at something which you know shouldn't be happening. The result of these experiments showed in graphic detail metal heating to a near-liquid state without heat. Hard metals would turn into soft, rubbery objects, proving that any substance could change its form if the science involved was understood. Welcome to Evolving Ideas. My name is Elaine Smitha. This program is dedicated to new and innovative concepts and creative ideas that uplift the mind of man in his quest for knowledge of the universe. We have a very exciting show today with John Hutchison, my guest, who you've just had an eloquent introduction to. When it really is sort of space age science, little science fiction, and alchemy. So we have a wonderful time here with brought some examples, and we're going to talk about how this all comes about. So, John, um, thank you very much for joining me on Evolving Ideas. Oh, thank you very kindly for inviting me to You've come all the way TV. from Vancouver, yes, British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And so, alchemy, that's, let's talk a moment about alchemy, because that's really, you're doing much of this alchemy. It, alchemy for our viewers is changing something sort of magically into something else. Um, I wouldn't really use a, fr a phraseology um, alchemic, although... In an essence, um, it is. Transmutation. It is, yeah. Yeah. Because I always think back to the 18th century or way b even earlier, earlier than that to um, the alchemics um, working with uh, changing different metals into gold, silver, Yes, and yes. Which is very interesting. Lead, yes. Very interesting processes. Well, actually, I guess uh, perhaps that is a, a misnomer since we're dealing with um, molecular changes in, in the metal. And I spent, mm -hmm. like, um, I have a degree in art, and I have specialized in jewelry making, and so I have done a little of that uh, molecular transmutation myself and ha understand how you can have the metals break apart because hmm. through say hammering is what you know is process of a jeweler it might be hammering and it could by hardening the molecular bonding within the configuration of the metal that it would become very hard and eventually would break mm -hmm. so annealing comes in which is a process of of heating warming the metal so that it can the molecular structure realigns itself and changes itself back into being mobile in an essence where you can go back and hammer it again. Mm -hmm. But now when I look at some of these things that you've done, they in essence appear similar to that kind of a process, but through a totally different process that you're working with. So uh, tell us more about how you got into this, how this happened. Oh, it started uh, as a, when I was very, very young, I started in this field and my main interest was the Tesla waves. Yes, uh, Tesla. For our Nikola viewers, could Tesla. you... Uh, Give just a little brief overview of Tesla. Tesla was a um, very brilliant nature oriented physicist, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> approximately from the 1880s on through into the, um, well, until his death. And he reached his height in the uh, turn of the century mm -hmm. at Colorado Springs and also at Long Island, New York. And he was responsible for our 60 hertz that we have Six, in our home. 60 hertz, um, um, also radio. Radio. And uh, microwave. Microwave. And it's just an endless number of things that I could list that he's sparked and started off in 
in what he was able to do. Do you think that you're a <coughs> follow-up on Tesla, that you could be a second Nikola Tesla for us? Well, I don't like saying that, but um, I was very interested in, in craftsmanship type of feelings towards creating all, of, reproducing all of his equipment. Mm -hmm. That, that in, a, uh, in itself is a monumental task. Well, I had a lot of time in, in the 70s um, doing that on my own, and I would patronize, patronize the scrapyards. That's a good place to start. And That's my favorite spot, too. Yes, and <laughs> the surplus stores, and mm -hmm. then get, I had a machine shop at the time, and I went into full production very heavily, um, especially in the 70, 70 time period until 1979. And I started getting these energy effects at a distance. And to me, it was hobby. It word leaked out, and when once the word leaked out, people started coming to the house in Lynn Valley, North Vancouver, and wanted to see what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So they took cameras and they brought um, um, many eight film equipments, and and took uh, films and pictures. Amazing! So and when you uh, when you made these Tesla coils, can you? Um, Tell just briefly, you took, it's a cylinder with copper wire wound around, correct? Basically, it's a cylinder that can be made um, with copper wire, per preferably with the old materials that they want, that they did use in turn of the century, such as double cloth covered wire mm -hmm. or uh, rubber covered wire. And plum wound it, meaning the windings are, have a, a slight separation. And then everything has to be shellacked and varnished and dry, super dry and basically built to the specifications of Tesla's um, electrical mechanical engineering ways. Because so you obviously have all of his papers? And I, well, not all of them, but I, I had an intuition to do this. Which Marvelous. Which led up to quite a, uh, led eventually up to a 20-ton laboratory. 20-ton laboratory, that's pretty sizable. <laughs> yes. I've seen some of the pictures and they're really astounding. Um, when you have these Tesla coils, you have like two coils that are established, and then within the center becomes the potential area? No, it's a six geometry f uh, phasing with the coils. What does that mean? Meaning that there's uh, six Tesla coils of different sizes, some very small, and these are put in a geometric positioning, but along only with support apparatus such as uh, electrostatic generators and uh, electromagnetic generators. And these, when in proper configuration, um, produce this energy at a distance, which has been measured up to uh, at least 300 feet away from the laboratory. Incredible. By a Los Alamos National Laboratory official. In so, 83. is this configuration geometric? Um, I mean, is it pyramidal in form, or um, not? Not pyramidal in form, but more circular forms and square forms that I have to align the equipment in, and especially toroidal forms, toroidal energy forms. You might explain that for our viewers, what toroidal means. Uh, would be that I would have a large ring inside of, um, inside of the laboratory, let's say, and this large ring would be charged either with high voltage direct current up to 200,000 volts. My goodness, so would that be around this way or this way? I actually had double loops, one going this way and then the other loop would be going this way. Mm -hmm. So and that would be like an electro, electric and magnetic, is it? In a way, in it's, a way. it's yeah, it, the whole thing was uh, to get these, uh, um, over the years of course, getting these um, in tune so they can resonate at, at the proper distance from the lab. Mm -hmm. And. Um, Okay, well, I think we have a, a clip on what your okay. lab looks like, or did look like, so let's see that now. There we go. Hmm. Oh, my goodness, it looks like a turtle. Yes. <laughs> bouncing around <laughs> on a tabletop. <laughs> yes. Oh, God, I'll have a little humor with this stuff. Yes, yes, or some soldier in the... <laughs> dug out with these bouncing around here. <laughs> so now it looks like the two objects, the little plastic bowl and whatever's underneath it is activated, but the table on which it is sitting is not. How were you able to control the manipulation 
through these energies that it's selective. It's very selective, and sometimes it gets very unselective. It'll take the whole table and, and all the samples in one, one time and throw them up in the air or float them along a Nile. Amazing. So it, it can be very, it's mostly very selective. How does that happen, and that it's so selective? Is it by material? I mean, you are dealing with frequencies. Frequencies that are very, actually very crude meaning that uh, the equipment that I had was old and after a while when the equipment is running for a while fr um, vacuum tubes will heat up and spark gaps will heat up so you get expansion and contraction mm -hmm. and the environmental um, area where the lab is of course you'll have electrostatics build up on everything eventually so you have to make constant adjustments I see so the, the effects can be very abrupt or very long in nature hmm and not without any control. So after a while, after I was discovered by Alex Pizarro, who this is dedicated to in a way, who discovered me, um, I, I would just get in the control panel room and just operate the controls and let the other people observe the effects. Amazing. Uh, Look at that, that ball, that that's steel ball. That's a cannonball that I cannonball. put up there, and that's um, that's approximately like a rough estimate now. It's about 30, 30 oh, feet. Oh, we just lost something. Thirty feet from the lab site, in another feet. part of the building where the uh, furnace room was. Incredible. And How much does that weigh? Uh, I think that weighs about forty or fifty pounds. I, I never weighed the thing, but it was like that, and it was fairly, fairly. <laughs> Well, I noticed Heavy. that it, it appears like it's being turned by hand. Yes, um, it's like what my colleague George Hathaway says, like it's under conscious control. Yes. That's now come bringing in again the idea that half the sci scientific community suggests that it's PK mm -hmm. in combination. Which is with psychokinetic. The, yeah, because this one here I was filming myself in 88 or 89. Mm -hmm. And um, the lab was running freestyle on its own. Amazing. And um, I had a friend who just would keep an eye on things so nothing would burn down, meaning you never, never know with such amount of equipment. You could have one wire that would come loose or break down or be affected, and you could cause a fire. Mm -hmm. So he kept an eye on things. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, uh, show us some of these components that you brought um, well, over all these years, we had, uh, let's see, quite a number of years to produce effects. And here we have a piece of standard extrusion al um, aluminum alloy that's used in machine, machine shop work. Machine shop, mm hmm And this one apparently was ripped apart in a way that it's like, almost like a piece of wood. Of course, it's not wood. And it's just like a great force. Uh, would rip this thing apart. Now, the energy to require to do that at a, at a distance, that is, has been calculated by some U.S. scientists and some scientists in France to be in the range of terawatts of power to do that. Terawatts. Now, tell, what, tell our viewers what terawatts Well, the only terawatts <coughs> is uh, trillions of watts of power. It could be trillions of watts of, um, of um, electrical uh, AC or DC. Or, or radio frequency. That's but, very high power. But, so since these operators, since the operators producing these effects um, could not do that on their own, they would have to then open a keyway into time and space in what they call the quantum fluctuations in time and space. Can you just explain for our viewers a little bit about that? Quantum fluctuations. Um, quantum is something very small. Subatomic. Yeah, subatomic on the subatomic level, and that um, in a given space, as my colleagues like to put it, space like this is enough power to boil off all the oce oceans of the Earth. Amazing. Just right here, right here, right in front of us. So you can imagine if that was uh, a cubic foot, or, or then it goes into a cubic uh, yard or into nine cubic yards, the amount of energy that is available. The idea how to tap into that is, of course, the technology itself has to be exotic enough to get down to that level for transformation into usable energy. Mm -hmm. um, 
So with these, with these samples, like this is stainless steel, a laser to cut that in half would take a tremendous amount of power and would be quite messy. Whereas this has some kind of a crystalline structure, it was once one piece, and it was just popped apart and plasma bubbles were formed inside there. I showed that to, do to Dr. Elizabeth Ann Rauscher, who suggested that it was plasma ball, plasma energy in there, somehow it was introduced into this. So plasma being a, a fluidity? Are Fluidic, uh, force, force state of matter type situation here. Although I like to view it, what I visualize is that um, it works on the subatomic level, on the interdimensional level, and perhaps is interfering actually with the time particles of um, of the atom itself hmm. and the graviton particles. Okay, you're going to have to bring our our um, novice audience up to par on some of these phraseology so that they understand what we're talking about. So graviton. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. That, so that. can you explain a little bit more about that, please? Well, okay. Um, basically, like uh, gravity waves. Um, emanate from the atom out, and it's a very, very, very weak force. Let's, okay, this is a very heavy piece of metal. It seems heavy, but really it takes all of the Earth to make it this weight. If I was to take it to the Moon, it would be quite lighter. If I was to take it to Jupiter, it would be twice as heavy. That indicates to me that there is um, a very inter interesting um, action coming from all of the atoms such a subtle, beautiful force that took all of the Earth mm -hmm. to make this heavy. But if you took two of these samples, or two chunks of metal like this, and put them out into deep space away from gravity, and they were still in motion, still, very still, they'd eventually draw themselves together. Again, Amazing. This is sort of leading into the um, area of Dr. Hal Pudoff and his approach on the same topic as the Hutchison effect, named by Alex Pizarro, on the Casimir effect. And Hal is doing research into putting together a mathematical model of of this type of um, these type of experiments that I've been doing. So this is really space age <laughs> technology that um, goes beyond a realm of association in our minds. It's really... It opens up many doors. You get many, many effects. Um, on analysis by the Canadian government of the Mini-8 film, we found that some samples would turn transparent on only one frame, and um, not classified, so luckily. So disappearing. So th here is one example of a sample inside of another sample. And this is a kitchen knife. And this is, extru again, extrusion. Um, extrusion means that it was uh, liquefied and forced into a mold. Yeah, so that's, you can't, mm -hmm. somebody say, oh, is this cast in there? No, it can't mm -hmm. be because then you do a proper spectrum analysis. and, mm -hmm. and that. So this piece was actually shaved down just to get to the knife, so that's why it looks so rough. Because we wanted to see what happened inside there, if it, if there was anything of the knife left, if it went into solution I in the see, metal. To yeah. see, I see, I see, but yeah. merged. Mm -hmm. So it it um, it, it did maintained that. its configuration and left a shadow on the very back here, which is kind of unusual. I, I see that. Oh, that is very subtle. Very Amazing. subtle. Yeah, we haven't figured out what that means yet, but that not that not only happens to different um, metals, but can happen to wood. We have one here of wood that. Uh, we found many samples with wood inside of it. One was analyzed by Siemens Labs. And I think also Los Alamos did an analysis on one. I can't. I'd have so to there's look wood up. inside with the metal coating on the outside. Oh, well, this one is this one is shaved down again because it left a similar thing because we didn't know what was in here. So then we started heating onto the wood, and I said to the guy with you know, was shaping it down. I said, okay, that's that's far enough because I don't want I don't know how much is in there if it's a so cubic, it cubic inch like or several it, inches. Would you say that it created a plating effect? No, it's like if you had a piece of wood on top of a sample in our test and that. Uh -huh. um, actually, there's another thing I didn't notice. It actually would float into the material itself and then stop. So it really is molecularly merging. Yeah. 
Can I hold that? Please do. Please do. It's um, got quite a little bit, a bit of weight to it. That's this ordinary aluminum, um, which is a little lighter than steel. Amazing. But we have had also transmutations that have been analyzed by Max Planck Institute. Los Alamos National Laboratories again in U.S. Army intelligence. I would imagine and they'd be very interested in this. Well, we, we were one of the first on the Star Wars uh, program in 83. My goodness. That was a four-month uh, test run, and that was classified. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Jack Howe came from McDonnell Douglas. Mm -hmm. Then the Canadian government came, and then after all the years, 750 demonstrations. My goodness, that's and a lot. The local TV stations would come and have fun with it, too. Great. Well, we have another insert. Let's bring that in and okay. see what that is. Good evening, Noah's with electricity. By machines. And his latest invention has a lot of people interested. It looks like something out of a Frankenstein movie. But this is John Hutchison's latest project. Hutchison is a modern-day inventor. He lives in Vancouver and supports his hobby of tinkering with old electrical equipment with money he gets from the Ministry of Human Resources. Hutchison suffers from agoraphobia, a fear of open spaces. That's kept him from holding a job and makes him eligible for social assistance. With lots of free time and very little money, his 20-year hobby has become a passion that's earned him a reputation. Well, I know I'm a bit of an oddball, and I don't mind. I'm a, I'm a bit eccentric and a little spinny, but I, I love it. But um, the, no, the uh, scientists um, took me serious. I've, I've had some contacts with UBC, and they thought it was a little off the wall. This maze of electrical devices is Hutchison's most promising invention. No one knows exactly how it works, but it apparently creates an electromagnetic field capable of moving objects from a distance. Basically, it's a device that project, projects energy at a distance and affects uh, test samples. It either bends them or breaks them up or lifts them up in the air or makes them go sideways. Hutchison says he can't give a demonstration of this phenomenon right now. It would take a week to hook everything up but its access to this room is limited. The equipment is being stored here only temporarily, and he may have to move it soon. Still, this amateur film shows what Hutchison claims his invention does. The objects you see are resting on a plastic milk carton close to his device. He says they rise in the air after he hits the switch, and sometimes metal objects simply bend or even break. You're looking at something which you know shouldn't be happening. Vancouver businessman Alexis Pizarro has seen Hutchison's project That's in action. That's pretty incredible. That's very, very incredible. I've done a little PK mm -hmm. with spoon bending, with using my mind, and this sort of appears like you must have some input with your own mind, consciousness. Um, I, I was John Alexander, um, who was with the group in '83. Um, it sort of introduced me into spoon bending and taught me how to do that. I thought, okay, I'll try. And he said, sit and relax and do it. So I, I managed to do it by forcing it. And I, it suddenly turned soft. And then once I realized it, it froze up again. I thought, so <laughs> when you release the thought, you surrendered to it, and then yeah. it, it moved. Yeah. And then John had to leave, and, and, the, and the group, and then I moved over to the other side of Vancouver. but. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, psychic play involved in all of this, too. I think if one is working with this kind of energy for a long time, they, they develop some type of um, contamination, if you want to s say it, from the equipment itself. And as it was recommended I'd contact Stanford University to see a Dr. Ryan about the accumulated neural sites or something on, on inside the electrobiochemical parts of the brain. Oh, I see. And I wrote him a letter and hopefully I'll get a response and that. And it's, um, it doesn't worry me. I know this worries me. It's just that it's quite interesting. Uh, so there is definitely, in my opinion, um, 
a very fine balance between the human potential in psychic and psychotronic and also the, the physics. It sounds to me like you may have, through the exposure to electricity, of course I'm not a medical doctor, I don't know, I'm just projecting, but hmm. the possibility of opening up neural pathways and increasing the synapses, which is the connecting units of electricity in our brain, that you've simply opened up more of your brain than many of us have. Um, I'm not sure of that. I'm, you know, like it's hard for me to step out of myself and look at myself, but I have been experimenting with neurotransmitter uh, inhibitors and exciters, and that's, of course, just basic amino acids from your health food store. Um, see if I can shift things around a bit. Because um, I find by <laughs> another one of my little hobbies is biophysics and nutrition and uh, life extension. So I got into the Dirk Pearson stuff for a while now, but um, there's no bad results. I actually feel quite good. Well, well what would you <laughs> want to change, John? <laughs> I'm interested in, in time and aging and all that stuff, and I, I'm curious on what these um, vitamin pools of B and N, C and other aminos and enzymes can do, actually. To prolong life. Pro life prolongation. Cease, cease aging. To remain <laughs> young and youthful forever. The old, <laughs> the old quest. But it's an interesting um, ex experiment. When I started reading the Dirk Pearson's book there, I was quite grabbed by what he was saying there and tried my own experimentations just to see what would happen. And so you're using yourself as your own guinea pig. Yes. I, I, haven't ex I haven't exploded yet on the corner street. I often joke to my, That's my great. friendly uh, supplier of vitamins and that. Wonderful. Uh, I haven't blown up yet. Okay. Well, let's take another look at some other clips that you've brought with us. This is wonderful. It's really expanding our awareness. Oh, look at that. That's just wobbling here. This so is the one that melts or um, this this is a chunk of stainless steel that just rips itself apart. Now the metals go undergoing these experiments seem to go into almost a plastic liquid jelly state. Mm -hmm. And will start falling apart. And, Amazing. and and pulsate with inside themselves and blow themselves apart. And um, Luckily, I was able to collect all these, or most of these samples. Look at that. That's the levitation of, um, I think it's a dish or something. And that's, my drink went off. We just lost the drink. So, <laughs> yeah. Cali. Um, that is a propane Whoop. cylinder. I was taking a chance there with propane I cylinder. I would think so. Well. And we're going to have a saw, and the saw is going to saw the wood as it flies up to the ceiling. <laughs> Uh, what I found interesting was, after a while, the board there, oh. it would... The inside, would it freeze and then lift? Well, I just took it out of the refrigerator because we had a refrigerator in the laboratory. But it lifted it right out and left the glass there. Oh, yeah. It does that once in a while. This, 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 <laughs> is, this is incredible. This is um, a frosty thing. Thick, a thick um, vanilla-type ice cream. Uh-huh. And what it's doing here is is actually pulling it, separating it from the material. But I think it, what does it do? I think it takes the the cup along with it. Now I notice it looks like there's some burn burn marks um, on the table. Yeah, these would. Oh, there it goes. Yeah. Looks these like one of those frosty cups. Oh gosh, <laughs> lost it. It's amazing. Now is this 400? Did you say 400,000 volts? Is that what you were saying? Uh, no, the power, power, lab power, I'm powering the lab, uh -huh. is um, about, uh, up to uh, 400 to 4,000 watts input, okay. 110 volts. 110 volts, okay. Because I do other experiments too and I mm -hmm. needed all this energy. So I would put in an estimate 2,000 2, watts power, 110 volts. And, and that would create these kinds of things we've just been seeing, yeah, 2,000 volts. Yeah. Because the camera people or the TV people once made the mistake of closing one of my vault doors, which had a cable coming in running the whole lab. Oh, gosh. And it just cut the cable. It's nothing really serious. And the, everything went off. 
So I quickly, of course, repaired the cable and then we went. We're able they, to continue. They went on filming it. So it was a demo live demonstration for Canadian national news. Incredible. Just incredible. And, uh, well, this sounds like there's lots of applications for futurist type of um, travel, mm -hmm. material utilization. Uh, what would be some of the things that this, these, this prin these principles could be used for? Um, the application. The, okay. Um, I backed out of the defense stuff because I, I didn't want to live in that world that in Livermore type situation with people under pressure and all that things. So I, it, I see the applications in, uh, in medicine for medicine, for new hmm. forms of hyper propulsion. That interests all a good portion of the scientists. And um, how would that affect? the health situation, how would that, what would that do specifically? It's just a Pandora's box. Um, there could be new molecular ways of reversing, let's say, tissue. If, uh -huh. if on the long run they discovered, yes, it is a time reverse particle, a time reverse waveform, I think we've actually reversed that sector. Of so healing, healing yeah. would be occurring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And bones mm -hmm. could be rejoined. They're mm -hmm. doing some experimentation with that right now. Yeah, all this, all this stuff could be done. And localizing, even the heart perhaps could be taken back of the whole body. I mean, um, are I'm just saying what the potentials are. Whether they become reality or not is only the future can predict that. But um, for propulsion, it is exotic uh, to drive starships, let's say, or spaceships. Well, we saw I've had all these yes, you had, stuff. You had a uh, had a little film clip from Disney, which I think uh, is not suitable for our showing here because of the um, quality of, of the quality mm -hmm. of the. Uh, is that a film that is out uh, that could be seen on video or something? It's 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 called the Navigator. And called the Navigator. It's made by Walt Disney Productions, and George Hathaway, my colleague, decided to put it at the end of the film. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. And it just depicts what the future could bring if um, all this technology that I was doing there could be um, brought out. And Pretty awesome. And um, the Japanese have a high interest in it, and they just want me to live over there. And they Do even, they? And they even wrote a book here that I Oh, share that with us. A little grab kind of quickly here. They put out a book, put out a video, and another book. And whoops. It's um, UFO. Well, they got that there, but they got my name down here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Can you read Discovering it? the Hutchison effect. I see. And um, in Japanese. <laughs> yeah, to my surprise. I yeah. love it. <laughs> so they got that in videos and. Did you get that on the uh, camera, so our viewers can see that? Maybe you can zoom in a little bit. Just hold it straight up there, okay. John, to keep the reflection away. That's very clear. That's very exciting. So the potentials that you're getting a lot of interest in is has to do with UFOs and uh, new means of travel by what has been to us something that is so alien <laughs> to us. Yes, but... Not to not to some other countries, which is interesting. Oh, in, tell us about that. Okay, in Canada, it's very bad. They just would laugh at you, and you can't go to your local university. In the United States, uh, you can go to McDonnell Douglas and not get laughed at. Uh, you can go to Los Alamos or the National Laboratories or even Washington D.C. and not really get laughed at. Um, you can go to Europe and um, same situation. But when I went to Japan, I was in for a shock because they just want full bore, go into it full bore. And when I gave lectures, there were sometimes oh, 200 people to 500 people Amazing. attending. And um, mostly scientists, and they? Science doctors and uh, scientists and investors like from Toshiba, people mm -hmm. from Toshiba, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and other large Japanese companies. And they're all incredible parties afterwards. I just, Yen and I were treated like a royalty, like like royalty. They come out of the lecture room. And they want to sign for me to sign the book and that. And the um, I, I was kind of embarrassed, of course. But I thought, what an input you get from these people. 
Yes, that's all positive, and it was coming back and forth. And I felt so good, you know. I felt, hey, I'm making a contribution. Making something. Well, you yeah. are now, John. I mean, <coughs> if indeed you um, are the, uh, I don't like to use the term the next Tesla, but that's our point of reference. Mm. With a, a genius mind as you have, and the capabilities of your research and your life devotion to this, certainly the things that you've come up with would put you on a par with him. And I find that yep. extraordinary in our time because we have so few heroes anymore. There's no one to emulate. And you are on the cutting edge of a whole new uh, dimension. Hmm. And that's what I love about my show, Evolving Ideas, because this is what we're about is to present new and innovative concepts, you know, to bring people up to snuff so we know what's going on. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be a hero or not, but I think it's the people that kick me in the rear end there to be a hero. Um, they're the heroes. They, I didn't think there was anything to this technology, and they, they really kept me going um, for years um, when I was wanting to quit in that. And I was big, like George Hathaway, Alex Pizarro, Colonel Alexander, Jack Houck, um, and Hal, Hal Pudoff. Elizabeth Rauscher, you know. Even did. Tom Bearden. And Thomas Bearden, good friend. That's wonderful. And the input was always positive thrust, you know. And, um, so they were the ones who found me. I was doing uh, isolation. I wasn't a salesman. I was doing this in total isolation. Alex found me and then brought in. But oftentimes these that's people. what happens, John, when <laughs> you're alone and you have time to be with your thoughts yeah. and you're tinkering with something you love to do, that's when the the genius becomes demonstrated. That's wonderful. So what can you tell us about this field? It has to do with electromagnetics, mm. and maybe we don't fully understand everything about electromagnetics. So, uh, you, you, you have to take electromagnetics, like let's say from this, um, like from a TV station or a, um, or a radio station, is electromagnetic energy mm -hmm. coming off the antenna. Um, but in certain situations, if it was formed into almost like a key, a key to come and unlock this vast quantity or reservoir of immense power in time and space. Potentials. It basically has to be formed first into a key. Mm -hmm. You can't brute force it all the time with no. stuff. It doesn't happen. It has to be very gently worked out into a key. Way. Once this key can fit into that realm, then you open up another situation so that these effects can happen to some uh, some of these things here. Whoops. <laughs> and um, there is still, of course, a lot of unknowns because um, It's it's such a broad ta uh, such a broad area, but luckily there was a lot of analysis done on, on some of the samples, which gave interesting results. What happened inside here? We'd have migrations of impurities coming on together, and and form forming, and like this sample here, which is aluminium. Aluminium. We have a copper coming right out of the solution here, coming to one end. Separation of, of elements. Separation of elements here, too. And um, during the last stages of experimentation, I found that uh, the field reduced background radiation, cosmic radiation, gamma radiation. Really? Yeah, up to a 75-foot radius. And um, this interested me because it was quite uh, repeatable because these effects were only five per hour, whereas the well, other that's one... That's an amazing piece there. I mean, absolutely thing, splitting it almost dimensionally. Mm, less than, I got all the, the small parts in bottles. I got about 500 pounds of these samples at home. He was just kicking around in there, but, so I take all the dust and put it inside of bottles uh -huh. to save it for analysis uh -huh. someday. And I promised Elizabeth Rauscher she'd be the first one to, to analyze them because, uh, <laughs> You can make mistakes with uh, scanning electron microscopes, but all these books here are just on analysis now. And the history of uh, what you've been doing. Yeah, dedicated, of course, to Alex again and uh, K 
Okay, so the brief history you have people like the prince involved from Liechtenstein and the prince from Liechtenstein. Yeah, and it goes on into the history photographs and that's a library. I have many, many of these. <laughs> I have what I call the media book, where the um, for the press to look through. Oh, pre what the press has already oh, the done. The press has already written. I have that over there, and this is more uh, experimental data and lab reports from Los Alamos. Here we have our friend here, John. Can you maybe hold that up, and our camera can get a shot of it, and you hold it straight up? So. Oh, we'll try to get. We gotta get John. I mean, John's making interesting news broadcast right now anyway with this non-lethal technology so we have John here can you turn that around so the camera can see it straight up or sure. maybe take it out of the book so so John you don't mind if I give you a plug no he doesn't mind okay <laughs> I don't think we can really see it going sideways though John Oops. Um, it needs to go the other way the book needs to be stood up you got it sideways oops <laughs> nobody's thought perfect thought it was going the other way You're there chilling. we go is that okay there, can you get that? This is the one where you gathered together in this warehouse and had um, oh, um, some styrofoam balls up above to see if there was any change in the yeah. atmosphere in the room when you were running some of these experiments. Yes, this is um, the Star Wars project. Star Wars think, project. Yeah. And I was put together by uh, the group um, well, from Inscom, which is an Inscom What group. is Inscom? Um, I'll know in a minute here when I find it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Arlington Hall Station, and it's, um, it's people like Stubbledine the Third. I don't know if that rings at all. Inscom, Intelligence Security Command. Um, such people, Albert N. Stubbledine. I don't think and L. Hendock and Paul Tyler, Dave Porter, Ruby Buser. That's from Los Alamos. Uh, no, this is from um, Arlington, Virginia. Oh, Arlington, Virginia. Yeah. Okay, so that would be like a governmental or military body? Yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's um, the gentleman that um, put together the group to come. I see. I believe that's what that is. That's part of this whole record of stuff here that goes on and on and uh -huh. on until... Infinitum, I guess you'd say. That's wonderful. So. John, uh, there has been uh, some reference to the Philadelphia experiment. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I love this because yes, some yes, people yes. have seen the video on Philadelphia experiment, which is a marvelous um, story about the disappearance of a battleship when they were just hoping to make it non-visible to their enemy, and it disappeared and then was brought back through one of the men going back into hyperspace. So, um, and I understand Einstein was involved with that in the very beginning and had felt that it was very dangerous and yeah. turned it over. And then Dr. von Neumann took on the effort and did indeed find that there were problems because the sailors were getting caught into the bulkhead of the, of the yeah. ship uh, when things cooled down and returned to three-dimensional reality. So there is some precedence that our viewers could could go and get that video and check it out and see how things can disappear through energies, uh, yeah. frequencies, uh, transmuting them into a whole other dimension where they're invisible, mm -hmm. which to my mind now makes the reality of other things in our environment that are there that we can't see because we haven't elevated our own consciousness to that degree of frequency where we can see them. Mm -hmm. But just because we can't see them doesn't mean they don't exist there. That's very true because we only see a very small, sh very small portion. Because mm -hmm. visible light is a very narrow spectrum mm -hmm. and the other realms in the electromagnetic spectrum are much more extensive than just the visible light. It's a vast sea of different uh, frequencies sea. and uh, and that's just the electromagnetic spectrum. And that's just, okay, so what One, one part of nature. Tell yeah. us about some of the other aspects. This is wonderful. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> but what are some of the other aspects that we might be considering out of the electromagnetic spectrum? Um, how do you mean aspects? Like well, effects? Um, well, you're saying there's more than just the electromagnetic. Oh, yes. We, we can get into, like, let's say ELF. Um, but the, the, the range on the electromagnetic spectrum is so vast you get right up into gamma radiation. Yes, and the cosmic. And then you can also jump away from electromagnetics and get into magnetics. 
Aha. So magnetics is a separate entity. It a is separate entity, another force of nature. How about electricity? Is that also considered a separate entity? It's a separate entity too. So we have uh, electro, electric, we have magnetic, and then we have electromagnetic. Is that Actually, correct? The, yeah, there's a lot. You correctly? You're understanding uh, in some way correct because they, they go even say that plasma now could be another uh, state that well, like we're getting into states of matter. But uh, the four basic standbys is electromagnetics, uh, weak nuclear forces, magnetic, and uh, hmm, what's the other one now? Gravitational? Yeah, gravitation, sorry. The most important one. <laughs> Momentarily <laughs> forgot. Yeah, no gravitation is what keeps us Too many vitamins. <laughs> Down. <laughs> that keeps us here on this planet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Walking upright on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, golly, that's that's uh, pretty incredible. There was one shot that they had that you had on that video about a bottle that appeared to be breathing, which yeah. I was fascinated with. The body, uh, the bottle had the cap on, mm -hmm. uh, with, in essence, no availability of the air to be transferred from in and out, mm -hmm. and, but yet the bottle was merging together as though it were breathing. So is, would that be conducive through the molecular aspect if we know that there's, there's molecules that are juxtaposed in any medium and mm -hmm. that there's spaces around those through which the electrons are moving? We noticed in, in the experiments over the years, we noticed um, was coined a, brief, a breathing effect on actually solid rubber pieces. And just this one lucky time, uh, a video camera was running and caught a bottle breathing in and out and in and out. Now I can only say that since it affects metals, atomic elements, of course, um, nitrogen and oxygen are atomic elements, mm -hmm. air. So perhaps it was compressing it, like in an hourglass form. Mm -hmm. Taking and pinching it mm -hmm. and expanding it, uh, the atoms. Interacting on each other. Yeah, just, just on the atoms of the air. Amazing. I, I would think that's more logical because it, it, was, it gave a wide, wide, wide expansion ratio as compared to these things, which give it a very narrow, mm -hmm. narrow one. You can't compress that. It were, if air, you, can't, you, you could squish it down a half inch or so use a lot of force, but here you can't, you really can't compress that only on maybe a few thousand atoms thick you can squeeze that in. So now there was also water that was boiling without heat. Yeah. And so I've had a little experience with ultrasonic, I, you know, where I can see this kind of bubbling mm -hmm. on top, but in, without heat. And so when you were doing your experimentation, explain how what you learned well, about that. What I wanted to do is try and copy it. I was always looking at the, um, the NASA photographs of the space shuttle and they get yes. some water going around. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to try and get that effect, but I never could really. So I just got this cup sitting on, on, a, on a milk crate mm -hmm. and it would just rip out little bubbles and throw them in the air. So what did you attribute <laughs> that action to? That's pretty wild. Again, that's the um, same, same effects of um, what I was experimenting with, on, with acted on the metal and... So it was and, the interaction on the water. It was the same, yeah. It w and also with the air. It, it seemed to be quite a, an interesting effect because it's very long and it, we'd always want to grab a, a ball, make a perfect little round ball and then throw it off in the air. But it wouldn't grab until later on. Um, what you saw there, the, uh, the cup, oh the cup, it took something out of there. And <laughs> That, you know, it's amazing <laughs> to me, John, how this can be so selective. Yeah. How you could have, you know, we have a no. cup here and the, and the moisture inside could just lift out yeah. without moving this or the this. I mean... It's selective, but I think it's very narrow band, meaning that, but also if, it, if there's shifting um, in the equipment itself, it'll, it'll just shift just a tiny bit and cause totally different effects. The keyway somehow interrupts with the with the with the f coming the all the power that is needed to cause it is coming from the time and space vacuum fluctuations or zero point energy as the physicists like to call it. Mm -hmm. It'll supply enough power to do this, and 
sort of running around in circles here. We once had the lab totally unplugged and itself powered itself. Oh, is that right? Which gave us a scare of a quite a scare. Really? Okay. Yeah. Well, we have another um, hmm. insert here. Oh, here we go. There we go. That's the, the water. Water popping around there. And I remember this is mini eight film. No, no, this is what's this now? This is something else. This 1988. Is, this is a video film. Uh huh. I thought the other one was mini eight film. Well, I'm sure you've had so many taken, it'd be hard for you to remember all of them. Like a, a case of videos that uh, hopefully will get them organized. Yeah, one of these days, right? <laughs> it's just, um, would it be like in the frequency that it would be just a, uh, you know, just a minute change shift? degree in mm. that frequency that would cause this to be so selective? Yeah, this is why I'm, I'm very interested in more modern stable equipment. Uh-huh. Well, now, John, um, I'm a novice. I'm mm. learning, but um, there was the bottle. <laughs> but mm -hmm. if we were to say that everything has a signature, there's the hemp pile, it's incredible. Everything has a signature, so everything would have its own frequency, just mm -hmm. like the barcode that we're becoming more familiar with. Right. The barcode signifying a certain frequency for every product, everything in the world. Mm -hmm. So if indeed everything had a signature and you simply were able to uh, somehow manipulate that frequency to, to tune in to that precise one of that signature of that item, then obviously that would be the one that would be moving. Yes. Yeah. So a changing the frequency, <coughs> changing to the signature, say, of the water alone would mean that you had simply dialed to that particular one. Mm -hmm. And then the, the bowl wouldn't be affected because you that wasn't the signature. That's right. So you could, you could go into an anti-gravity mode or, um, let's say, an anti-radiation um, anti, um, mode. Anti-radiation. But, but as I mentioned before, that the effects are so random that a lot of people were upset over that randomness, and sometimes some effects wouldn't even happen for hours, and people start walking back and forth, oh, this crazy stuff, you know, it's really, hmm. But um, that was in the early days, but when I got more stabilized, mm -hmm. then I could almost guarantee effects that it, for that it the visitors. Control that a little better. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I brought in uh, Excalibur Briefing, which was written by uh, Colonel Thomas Bearden. And uh, I think we do have a clip on Thomas Bearden and what he says about your work. And it's quite complimentary and extraordinary. And if our crew can pull that up, why we'd like to show that now. Thomas Bearden, I hope to bring eventually here because he's been very involved with paranormal. Oh, yeah, he's quite a phenomena. scientist. Extraordinary. Yes. So um, there he is. Can we listen to him? Where are you? Some of the work of uh, the lone inventor uh, John Hutchinson in Canada, Vancouver, Canada. Hutchinson takes two Tesla coils and uh, essentially puts in the center of them a target, which in every target has certain nonlinearities, and then blasts away with these two coils at them. Basically, what he establishes is an electromagnetic fighting itself, electromagnetic forces fighting themselves. And gravitational force is made when a gravitational potential is made, when electromagnetic forces fight themselves to a draw, when, in other words, the gradients become zero. The, uh, the gradient vectors or the resultants become zero, but the two forces are still in there slugging it out. All the energy is still going. The work is still going, but it's trapped locally. That's internal energy. That's what gravity is. And the Whitaker paper tells very well how to do that. So when John got things just right, he didn't have control of it, absolute control, but we, he bored in there with persistence. And when he got things just right to get the forces to fight to a draw, and there was the right nonlinearity in the target, he would have levitation of things, even 64 pounds. He would also, another thing you do with such a thing is you cause uh, the magnetostatic potential to change a vacuum. In other words, that's pole, an unfortunate name in magnetism. But uh, in other words, it causes deposits of monopoles inside 
uh, materials such as metals. And you'll literally have the monopoles repel each other and you'll have the explosive separation of metals into all kinds of grains and structures according to the waves in the Tesla coils <coughs> that you're bombarding it with. And so he produced a magnificent breaks, Hutchison did, in metals and splits as if it were Venetian blinds. And uh, another thing it does, since this stuff comes from the nucleus out, it doesn't go through the electron shells, its medium is the nuclei. Uh, what you have then is you have changes in the atomic nuclei and which result in lattice changes. You have the production of alloys which cannot be made in this world with, natural pro with normal processes. And some of those alloys appeared in John Hutchison's work as a result of that kind of bombardment. Another thing you have is uh, once charged with scalar radiation, the, the nuclei then continue to discharge over a long period of time. And so the material continues to change, the alloy form and so forth, over a period of even a year. And you had those changes occur in this work also. I'd like to thank you for joining me today with Evolving Ideas and John Hutchison. Join us next time on Evolving Ideas.